Good morning, everyone. Um, to my left is our um, guest of honor here, Paul LeBlanc, president of Southern New Hampshire University. Um, my name is Steve Leshley. My job is to ask Paul a couple of questions today. Um, the frame for the next 40 minutes is the book that Paul has written. Um, we'll get him talking about that. Um, just before asking the last question, um, Paul and I have decided to let the mics come around, um, so we'll have some Q&A uh, towards the back end of the 40 minutes. Um, welcome, Paul. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be with you. Great All to right. be with you. Um, I'm going to start by reading an excerpt uh, from the opening pages of Paul's book, and that's partly so that you can get a sense for the book. Um, it's also, more importantly, so that you can get a sense for Paul's empathy for students and who he is. My family, this is Paul writing, immigrated to the United States in 1960 from a hard scrabble farming village in the Canadian Maritimes. We settled on the south side of Waltham, Massachusetts, just two blocks from the old Waltham watch factory in a melting pot neighborhood of diverse ethnic backgrounds and multifamily homes. My father worked in construction as a mason my mother in a factory as a stitcher making car tops. They often picked up extra income cleaning offices and homes. I remember learning English and how to read in the study of a beautiful home in Weston, Boston's wealthiest suburb, sitting in a window seat with the sounds of vacuuming and my mother's soft singing as a backdrop. My parents had eighth grade educations, which was common then in rural Canada. And no one in our large extended family had ever attended colleges. College was reserved for children who live in homes like the ones my mother cleaned, an unthinkable option for me. This book is rooted in my own story, my unshakable belief that education remains the greatest force for social good that we have available to us, and my growing conviction that the American higher education system that worked so well for decades and became the envy of the world is failing. I am not concerned about all students. I am concerned about students of all ages from lower and middle class socioeconomic backgrounds who face an uncertain future. They need something different, not lesser, but better suited for their lives. It's pretty good writing. <laughs> it's okay. The book is called okay. Students First. Um, Paul, this is personal for you. Um, the work you do, the hope you have for higher ed, please comment. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I schmaltzy about the American dream because I lived it. Uh, first generation, as, as Steve said, or I say in the, in the book. And when I, you know, the key to this, when I look at my parents who had eighth grade educations, and I look at the life of my daughters, it's a life that's almost unimaginable to my parents if they were still alive today. And it's one that was made possible by my access. I'm the conduit of that through high quality, affordable higher education. One that didn't give me debilitating debt, one that had enough space for someone to know my story, for talented mentor teachers to take an interest in me. Uh, one that I know in a public institution that wasn't at the time preoccupied with mission creep or status or being in rankings, but really more concerned about on-ramps for kids like me. Um, so, it, and I, my fear, of course, is that that American dream story is less available to the recent immigrant from Dominican Republic or Haiti or Mexico, uh, or to the person who just came out of prison or for the person whose family, you know, whose parents are working two jobs and they're stuck in an underperforming high school where, you know, there isn't admissions counseling and there isn't all of the things that were available to me when we had a greater public commitment to our schools, both K-12 and post-secondary. And look at, we're leaving too many people behind. Stig, you know, the, Stig knows the stats better than I do. 45% of those who start don't finish. 40 million Americans with uh, some credits, no degree in debt, the worst kind of the triple crown that you can have, uh, growing wealth inequity with all of the political and social turmoil that comes with it. Um, this is bad for all of us. It's bad for us as a country. If you read Paul's book, this half of Paul um, 
his humanity will come through. The book is full of stories of students and kids. Um, it's also a technocratic book, Paul. Deeply, you're a geek um, on higher ed. And for those who haven't read the book, summarize it in two minutes. In all its technocratic glory, Paul, um, define competency-based education, yeah. summarize the thesis. Yeah, it's a book that takes fundamental issue with a higher education system built on the credit hour and tethering to time. Time isn't a good uh, measure of learning. It tell, we're really good at telling the world how long someone sat, but not what they actually know and what they can do. And it's also deeply inequitable because if you are poor, you have less time and you have less control over time. If you work in a job where you don't even know what your schedule is two weeks from now, how can you commit to being in class on Wednesdays at three o'clock, right? So we have to really rethink this system, which I think I started with, hey, I'm really enthusiastic about competency-based education, which is simple. It's got two questions. What are the claims you can make for what your students can do with what they know, and how do you know? How do you assess that? Two simple questions that we could spend all day unpacking because it's actually pretty complex and hard to do well. But when I started that, I really wasn't fully appreciative of the inequities that are built into our system. So I'll just give you one other stat. So the obvious one I said, which is you know having less time. I mean, if you don't have a washer dryer, it takes longer to have clean clothes. I don't even think about that. I walk down the hall on the way to get a sandwich and I throw a load of laundry in. Right? If you don't have a car, it takes longer to have food in your fridge. So, so those, those inequities, of course, around time. But remember that, uh, on average, nationally, someone who uh, graduates with a two-year associate's degree, when they transfer to a four-year school, loses, on average, 43% of their credits. Who goes to community colleges? Inequity. We're going to make poor people take longer. We're going to charge them more. It's gonna, they're going to spend more. Right? And, they're gonna, and, the, and, and there's... A, a, so, it's obvious, it's self-evident. Um, Paul, if competency-based education is such a good idea, why is it so rare? So, it's increasingly less rare, or it's more common. Uh, I was on a panel yesterday with Charlotte Long from the CBAN, from the Competency-Based Education Network, and she would point out that at their recent conference in the fall, there were 200 more institutions attending who were there to start their first CBE program. So I think we've gone through the kind of the Gartner curve that the MOOCs went through. A rational exuberance, and then disappointment, what they call the slough of despair, and everybody says, oh, that was another fad that's gone away, and then quiet, quiet spreading and building. So that's what happened with the MOOCs, if you think about it. A rational exuberance, go change the world, oh God, those MOOCs are a bust, and now, of course, Coursera is part of an important part of the higher ed landscape. edX just got sold for $850 million. And you know, so, so I think we're going through a very similar movement. However, there are structural impediments and federal financial aid policy, which are all tied to time, that makes it very hard to support CBE programs. Accreditors have been slow to understand it. And then there's just institutional resistance built in quite deeply, right? Um, Stay there for a minute, Paul. Yeah. Um, take those three barriers, organizational ones at colleges, say a little more about them, Paint a real picture for the audience of what happens when a college president runs into an accreditor and said, I just, I just read Paul's book, let's rock and roll. Will you please accredit a direct assessment CBE program? Talk us through that a little more. And also some of the financial aid, Department of Ed stuff. And so live in there a little more, Paul, about what's really there on the ground holding it back and try to force rank those three barriers to the adoption of CBE. Sure, so institutionally, um, CB's hard. So you have to, we are not very good in our incumbent higher ed at actually making clear claims for what students can do. We do it better where our lives depend on it. So we tend to do it with things like nursing, medical school, aviation, we're training pilots. We're pretty clear about the skills they need to possess. That said, by the way, a big healthcare system like Providence Health, which has 54 hospitals um, on the West Coast, they still won't take a nurse fresh out of nursing school with all of that preparation and put them on the floor. They have an internal academy because they still don't have the skills that are necessary to train them. But let me go back to your question about institutions. So it's hard to do. Um, we have to be much, much clearer about our claims. Faculty resist that kind of accountability. Assessment's very hard. It's probably the weakest part of our ecosystem, institutionally speaking. We don't, generally speaking, as an industry, do assessment very well. When I was at the Department of Education doing a stint there working for Ted Mitchell, 
when he was undersecretary, we brought in AIR to talk about assessment. And they basically, I'm not, this is not exactly their words, they said higher education assessment is somewhere between awful and dismal. It's, I mean, in terms of the science of assessment. So you have that resistance. Um, I think, you know, the systems are all built for the credit hour. So we don't understand how to measure competencies. We don't know how to do trans, we do know about this resistance to the transcripts part of this. And also in the end, if we were doing it really well, we would have an open skills network, right, nationally. Um, and we would all know how do we fit into that framework. We're not saying what skills, you build your program any way you like, but you'd be able to translate within that framework. Well, remember how well Common Core did, right? So we're not having outside entities tell us what we, what we can teach and give us sort of external framework. So for all of those reasons, you get a whole lot of resistance. Um, and then from an accreditor perspective, I will say accreditors are slowly getting better, but accreditation is built on inputs. Accreditation is built on you know, how select, um, how many faculty with PhDs, what are your sort of ratios of faculty, how big is your endowment? It used to be, if you remember, how many volumes in your library, which we don't do anymore sensibly, but it's all about inputs. It's, you know, in some ways, higher education is a faith-based initiative. If all of these inputs are there, we have faith that good things will happen on the other end. And what you're really arguing for competency-based education is to shift the spotlight to the outcomes. Let's measure, actually. Let's know and assess what students can actually do. Let's look at a whole bunch of other outcomes. And then we'll give you a lot of space to think about how you get students there. So one of the things I really love about this idea is when we shift the spotlight to outcomes, you unleash innovation, right? Because we don't, in some ways, go crazy, be imaginative, think about new ways. So in the book, I use case studies um, around, you know, all kinds of interesting institutional responses. Of course, WG was the best known, and they're a pioneer in this space, but there are others that are really interesting. The other thing that we run into all the time for both accreditors and for our institutions is that competency-based education is often associated with vocational skills. Like, it's great if you want to be a pilot. It's great. It's more than vocational. John, John's a pilot over here. Um, you know, if you're a programmer, I can see if your code compiles. It's visible. I can track that. But I would argue that it's just as good for philosophy and one of the programs we feature in the book is a seminary, a the theological seminary that has fully embraced competency-based education because they need their graduates to be effective. They want to know what efficacy looks like. If you are a minister, if you tend to a congregation, how do we know what success looks like? What are the things that you have to be good at to do that job well? And how can we measure it? And then I think the third was federal. Yeah, federal. So federal financial aid is a whole chapter on federal. It's the wonkiest. All the sex and violence come in the chapter after the federal financial aid chapter. The federal financial aid chapter can get pretty boring if you don't sort of like the wonky policy stuff. But in the end, like everything else in life, watch how the money flows. And if, the, if you track dollars to time, it's very hard to get at non-time-based programs like the one I advocate for. Um, so think about the, uh, the time-based terms. We, we define the credit hour, we, we define term, which is a measure of time. Satisfactory academic progress, a measure of time. So again, so what happened, you may or may not know, we, there's a sh short history of this, but um, there was legislation in the last authorization of Title IV which said um, t financial aid can be distributed on the basis of actual student learning as opposed to the credit hour, which you would think, shouldn't we distribute financial aid on student learning? That seems like the most. But they gave that provision. But then what happened is that all of the administrative rules under that never were addressed. And this is how policy making happens within government by bureaucratic entities and stakeholders who don't like the actual thing, right? So, so right now there's something called negotiated rulemaking happening. And it's in Negreg, which is the wonkiest, like if you need to go to sleep, watch the live webcast of Negreg. But it's in those debates where actual sort of progress gets made or is impeded. Um, theory of change, Paul. So the just for the audience over what is your sense of timing for the revolution to triumph? Um, I think you tell a story about proof points and adoptions at colleges that somehow eventually tips into a response and an accommodation from accreditors and ultimately into the regulatory morass that you're describing. But frame that for us. What's sure. your sense of sequence and timing? So remember in slight defense of regulators, the policy should always follow practice. When we try to do policy that anticipates practice, you get terrible sort of policy. 
because you can't, I mean, they're still in Title IV talking about microfiche. It's like, remember, this is a, this is a U.S. department that still uses mainframes and Fortran for a trillion dollars of financial aid. So, so we want to we wanna drive with practice first and then have policy follow based on good practice. So we have good practice now. We know how to do CBE well. It's proliferating, as I said. There is a time. There's also a con context matters. And context right now matters a lot because employers are in a talent war. They're looking for skills. They're shifting to the skills-based hiring. You have new players in the ecosystem like Grow with Google who are out there you know, with micro-credentials and lining up 150, 200 employers, I think Lisa has now in her portfolio, is saying, no, we'll take a Google, Grow with Google certificate. We'll hire on the basis of that. That's skills that we really care about and that we value. So the context, I think, is, is, is sort of in our favor right now. And there are tools we can use. So in the book, I call for what's called the demonstration project. Again, sorry for the wonkiness. But demonstration projects are things that Congress can do, and they allow the Department of Education to waive the standard rules. Right? It's a waiver program. And there's a really famous one. It was called the 50%, uh, the, it was a project around the 50% rule. The 50% rule used to say that if you were in a degree program, at least 50% of your education had to happen on site. And there was a demonstration project that said, we will allow a select number of schools to waive that. You can go 75% online. You can even go to 100% online. I was at a small liberal arts college. It was one of the first selected, and we did our first fully online programs. It's where the idea of a fully virtual degree first happened. That spawned the growth of online learning. It's, it flipped it overnight. Um, what's different, and it may not, you may not remember it because it was actually the not-for-profits looked down their nose at it, and it was the for-profits that rushed into the vacuum. So this was the period that impelled the growth of Phoenix, ITT, Corinthian, Kaplan. Many of them kind of got into bad practices, as we know. They're bad players. But now we're at this place where not-for-profits are reclaiming that market with a vengeance. My institution's one of them, but there are many others in that space. I think if we could get a demonstration project, we now have enough practice in place. We have a context that's ready. And I think you would have a lot of schools putting their hands up to say, we want in. Because that's one of the great impediments is the way we have to administer financial aid. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Um, and you're very substantive and quite geeky, but you also have really cool sneakers on. Paul. Vintage, just, custom, I just, vintage I just Air Force Ones. And I was hoping someone would notice. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, Paul, you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned priests and philosophers a minute ago. Um, what are the limits to CBE? Are there students and topics that it cannot reach? So remember CBE is not about content, it's about an architecture. It doesn't dictate content. So you could layer on to that architecture. So think of it as the you know, underlying engineering, man, the mechanical infrastructure of a home. You can have any kind of sort of style home you want. So I would argue that, and I would sometimes get this, you know, some, I remember somebody, you know, a philosopher said to me, look, I get it. Computer science, sure. Healthcare, sure. Engineering, sure. CB, go for it. But what am I supposed to do with CB? Like, am I, am I a student supposed to prove or disprove the existence of God? Like, what, what does a competency look like? And I sort of remind him, and you know this, you talked, we talked about this, right? That the McKinsey's of the world recruit from the philosophy departments of major universities. Why? Because those students know how to do things. They have knowledge and skills critical thinking, right? They can sort of do modeling, they knew language, synthesis, I mean, communication, uh, all of that. So I actually think, I came up through the humanities, that CB actually could be a basis for reviving the humanities. Because as we move into a future in which so much labor will be displaced by algorithms, particularly skills-based labor, and I don't mean hand skill, I mean skills like accounting, like, my, I'm, in, I'm in the pessimistic camp. I think we're going to see huge labor displacement in the white-collar professions. The things that will be hard to displace will be distinctly human kinds of work. And this is a place where I think CB and the humanities could really strengthen the game. Strengthen our hand. I, am, I had a hard time following you there, Paul, because I was imagining a McKinsey partner interviewing an undergraduate who'd failed to prove the existence of God and then hiring, <laughs> and as, that's dark and beautiful at the well, same time. So. Only because most McKinsey yes. partners think they are God. So. <laughs> exactly. There's a, there are a lot of jokes there uh, if we lose out on other things to talk about. Um, so Paul, you often say that, and you have said even here, that uh, competency-based educational designs are 
very difficult to execute on. Um, and when you go down that road, you head like a bee to the complexity and the nuance of assessments. And you are a big fan of something called direct assessments. Take us into the pivotal, important um, dynamics around assessments in competency-based education. Yeah. So, if you think about those two questions I mentioned, Steve, it's you know you, you always it's a it's a process of reverse engineering. So, if I say I want to build a competency around writing in the workplace, I start with the end product. What does that look like? How do I define it? What is the rubric? What is the action? The behavior? the end product that would tell me someone possessed those skills. And then I back into, okay, if that's what the practice looks like, now I know what my assessment needs to be. So I next go to my assessment. What would be the artifact? What would be the thing you could do to show me that you're a competent writer in the workplace? And then I would start to think about, okay, if I need to get you those skills, what would the learning look like? What's the pedagogy, the content? How would I construct the learning for you? And we did a panel yesterday. I moderated a panel with three of our students, all about to finish. And what they talked about, and they were talking about writing, actually, so I hadn't thought about that, but they were talking about writing, and they were talking about how comfortable they are now doing writing at length. One of them jokes like, I used to worry about a one-page paper. I get a 15-page assignment. Like, so what? Like, I could do that all day long. How many college students would say that, I think, if we walked around many campuses, right? So we go back into this, go back to your question. So now I've designed the thing, um, and now I have to, you know, authentic assessment. I'm going to use authentic as opposed to direct assessment. I'll explain why in a moment. But authentic assessment says, I'm going to give you real-world simulations. I'm going to give you hypotheticals in which you have to do that workplace writing which means it has relevancy. You could use, they, the students yesterday talked about the skills I learned today, I put to work tomorrow at work, they'll work, right? So that's authentic assessment, as opposed to the world of assessment that's so common in higher education, not with writing, but in other areas, which would be exams and, and tests and quizzes, which none of us do at work. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what are we measuring in those instances? So if I were to do uh, let's use math as a better example. Um, I might have uh, an assessment that gives you a, uh, a hypothetical that says, you know, you're looking at three proposals. This is the analysis you have to do. You need to use a spreadsheet, do the math, present the recommendations. Now that feels like the way that math gets used in the real world. It feels relevant, and I can put that to work tomorrow as opposed to taking a math test. Um Paul, go back then to the modal, typical faculty member. Because what you just described is on the one hand, obvious, intuitive, legitimate, proven in the real world. That's, by the way, how McKinsey would interview the character we just described. It's also going to require a typical academic designer or a teacher in a university to start all over with standards, assessments, leading into teaching. So. Walk us back, you hit this a minute ago. It's one of the institutional blocks to this. Um, but fill in the picture for us. How do you persuade a typical administrator or faculty member to redesign? So I, I and I argue this in the book a little bit, I, I think it's very hard to do this in institutional structures that calcify or perhaps more generously canonize the way the work gets done. So if you think about tenure, promotion practices, how workloads get assigned, et cetera. So my argument to my colleagues has always been, take the Clay Christensen model. Clay's an old friend of both of ours, was an old friend of ours, and was on my board for nine years. And what I would say is, create safe spaces to experiment. Give people the latitude to break the rules, or at least play by new rules, and then protect them. My job as a leader is to protect the experiment. So what I want, if I'm in an institution that isn't doing this but wants to do it, is, I need to find a willing, uh, positive deviant. Do you all know that, that phrase, right? So I find a positive, someone's like, I really like this idea. Buy them the space and the time and protect them. And then ideally, encourage them to build a program for someone I'm not serving today. Because as soon as I try to build a program for someone I'm serving today, someone's putting their hand up like, wait a minute, you're cannibalizing my program. You're taking away my students. So Clay would always say, you, don't only, you not only want to find an underserved population of learners in this case, but you want to find learners that you say don't serve. And it makes it a lot easier. That's how you do those initial experiments. Now, you could do it in disciplines where you don't work. So we're launching. We don't do a whole lot in healthcare. We're moving into the micro-credentials, who isn't these days, but we're doing it in healthcare. And it's all CBE-based because it's, it, we, won't, we get less resistance. And that's at a place that's still pretty innovative, generally speaking. 
Paul, you just said this is hard to do in environments that are calcified and canonized, I think you said. I think that's higher education in America. So how many positive deviants like you are there, Paul? And where do they come from? The question and, that way. <laughs> yeah, honestly, Paul, I mean, this is a, um, are we banking on the voluntary choices of college leaders here to run into the um, ossified structures that you're describing? It's a really, it's a, it, it's a hard question. I, I actually finished a, a second book that's coming out later this year, and I looked at this question in multiple industries. I spent a year interviewing people in healthcare, mental health treatment, K-12, criminal justice, and others. Um, there is, throughout higher education, a deep sense of calling. So many people who come to the industry do it because they want to educate and they want to work with students and want the world to be better. Something happens. And the something that happens is you move into structures that give you roles to play. And you know what human beings do? We tend to almost always play the roles assigned to us. So if you're a prison guard who's been taught that everyone that you work with who's in a cell is a beneath contempt human being, you'll start to play that role. Um, I learned this from someone in this room who's an incredible thinker about this stuff. Um, so I think, and then the structures of reward and the structures of punishment will calcify or reify those roles. So if uh, I have two daughters, both in academia, son-in-law is in academia, and I'm watching them at the beginning of their career at R1 universities, and I have to keep reminding them, you know, this passion you have for students and the time you want to spend with them, good for you. Be careful. Because when you come up for tenure, that's not going to matter very much. What will matter is scholarship, service, what, how you've done your collegiate, blah, 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 right? So we know this. So the systems, um, so let me give you just a, a couple of examples from this book that I alluded to. I interviewed Loris Barretts, who's this amazing head of, that was the amazing head of the Utah, University of Utah healthcare system. It was the lowest performing hospital system in the country in terms of patient satisfaction. In five years, he made it number one in the country. Not just like at the top, but the number one, right? But when he looked at what was happening, all of his clinical staff were getting rewarded for how many patients they could see in a day. This is not a surprise to any of you. And how insurance uh, reimburse them was about how many tests do you prescribe, how much lab work do you prescribe, how many procedures can you do. And the result of this is that patients felt like they were never seen, they were never talked to, they, no one respected them, no one asked them about themselves, none of the clinical staff spent any time really getting to know them as a human being, and that began the dehumanization and their unhappiness with this. And this is backed up in the research, right? You know this, if a physician spends only 10 more minutes with a patient, the likelihood of being sued for malpractice, even when you do malpractice, even when you get something wrong, plummets. Because, it, no, that's, that's, that's Muhammad, like I know him. He's, he's my doctor, I've known him for ages, right? Um, he made a mistake. So, so Lawrence changed what gets paid for, what gets rewarded. Um, I think you're an extraordinary leader, Paul, and I think humans like you are probably the at least opening gating factor to this positive world. And so on that question, I'm going to ask you one more. And everyone, after this question, we're going to pass the mics around. Um, so get ready. And then I'm going to ask Paul one last question, and we'll be done in about 12 minutes. Um, Paul, this is a conference about the future of higher ed. Um, I've been looking around and I can't find any members of the leadership from Ivy League colleges or from other highly selective, immensely wealthy, powerful and branded universities. Where are they and what's their relevance? The greatest, I've always said often, the great impediments to uh, innovation in higher education is a large endowment and a heady reputation. There's no incentives in innovating, right? And you, have all, and you think it doesn't make sense. You have all of the resources to do it. But, but innovation often creates new winners and losers. And so you're asking for institutions who are built on things like exclusivity. Um, 
to think about innovation that would extend what they do to more and more people who desperately need what they do. And I've had these conversations, and I know most of those leaders, and they're good people. And I remember Larry Bacow when he was appointed to the presidency at Harvard. Uh, Larry said, so Larry's story is that his mother is a Holocaust survivor. His father fe uh, fled the pogroms of Eastern Europe. Uh, he grew up in Michigan. Uh, and you know, he's been he's an extraordinary leader and a wonderful human being. And when Larry was hired, he said, "Look, at, I understand how Harvard is relevant to the elites of the East Coast and the West Coast, but I don't know if Harvard is still relevant to a kid growing up in a working class family in Michigan, which is his story." And and I don't know that Larry solved for that, but the leaders of our elite institutions like think that they they have always been elite but they now understand that they're being seen as elitist. And when you ask that question about my background at the beginning of, of this conversation, um, the elites still found room for those working class kids. Berkeley alone has more Pell Grant recipients than all of the Ivy League put together, right? They have lost their way in that sense. And the problem, and I think leaders recognize this, they are now seen as part of the problem. It was one thing to be seen as the elite place that your kid might aspire to, but they're actually seen as part of the problem. And, and when you see a tax, for example, on the ability to impose a tax on their very large endowments, that is a reaction in policy, in a political reaction, among people tapping into that kind of resentment. I sit on the American Council of Education board and we, uh, every year, ask Gallup to do a poll on attitudes, American attitudes, towards higher ed. It's plummeting. It makes me really sad. I love this industry. I know we, we're critical to turning things around, but it's plummeting. And most Americans, working class Americans, can name a handful of institutions. They recognize Harvard and Yale, and they recognize the, uh, the schools that they see on Saturday afternoon playing football. But the drop-off after two dozen names is profound. They don't make a distinction. They don't make much of a distinction. This feels wrong to me, but they don't make much of a distinction between for-profit and not-for-profit. Um, but they're increasingly uniform in one thing. We're being gouged. Um, and the Varsity Blues scandal was not a surprise to them. They looked at Varsity Blues and said, see, we always told you the game was rigged. It was confirmation. It wasn't, it wasn't a shock. It was a shock to the rest of us, but it wasn't a shock to them. The floor is open. Um, let's see. Uh, why don't we go down here to the front, right here. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was great. Um, I also saw your presentation yesterday with your three students, and that was amazing. Um, you talked about assessment for the student products. How do you use that assessment in the CB? E framework for program improvement. What happens after you get that material in and you want to make the program better? Yeah, so I think um, there are a couple of things. Thank you for coming to yesterday. So these students were amazing. Uh, three students of color, all of them on pace to graduate faster than you would typically in a four-year program. Two of them graduating in under four years, slightly under four years, one graduating in three. Two of them with no debt, one of them with only very, what he called good debt. Uh, if you remember. Now let me go to your question about sort of quality assurance. So I've often said that in the future we will still see accreditors, Stig, um, and we hopefully will see some new ones. Um, but to ex increasingly, uh, employers will be the accreditors of choice. They will be the arbiters of quality. So when someone says about a Grow With Google certificate, we will accept this. They'll accept it as long as that person continues to demonstrate the skills they're supposed to be demonstrate. And that's the beauty of CB is that because you have to have clarity of claims, you also have accountability. And you have to keep delivering on accountability. And one of the things that's a structural impediment, Stieg, is that we know this. Skills, the half-life of skills is three years now. So even if you don't change your job, your job is changing out from under you so quickly. So traditional higher ed is not built for this. One of the things I like about a lot of the best coding boot camps is if you know there's a new Python subroutine introduced today, it's in the curriculum tomorrow. Think about what that looks like. I mean, the infamous case of Bates College that would spend 10 years on trying to redo their gen ed program and then just gave up. They surrendered, like, we can't do it. 
we'll just stay with the old one, right? So we, <laughs> that's an extreme case. But So I think it, it really is going to be driven by the conversation with employers. And the beauty of competency-based education is that it gives us a lingua franca. We speak a common language. Employers think about competencies and skills. What can my people do? What can't they do? What do they need to do tomorrow? Thanks. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> If I could just build a little bit on what you said about employers, I'm curious about the Grow With Google certificates because in the community-based world, everyone was excited to partner with companies like Google on their certificate programs, but we're not finding a widespread adoption by other technology employers who say that these certificates are valid. And so I'm wondering in the future, what role do employers play in actually designing the CBE types of programs and, and, and how much driving do they actually do or how much should they be involved in the in the driving of that yeah it's interesting that when we did our programs started our programs we worked with a lot of employers here was an interesting thing we discovered outside of technology where the skills are very well defined employers weren't really great at telling you what skills and competencies they needed and we had to spend a lot of time working with them to unpack their job descriptions and really get at this very quick example we were talking with a healthcare system that said we need more people um, in our nursing homes they ran a lot of nursing homes and as we started working through one of the things that says uh, teamwork is really important so we said describe to us like what that looks like remember my example like tell us what success looks like well actually it wasn't teamwork in the sense of teams working together all day people who work in nursing homes actually work in isolation you got 14 patients and you're going room to room and you're filling out charts it was critically important during a shift change it was in that moment where i got to say i had to say like oh ken mrs so-and-so and roommate like I noticed this today, you're gonna to need to check on that. And it was really about communication and handoff. So teamwork as a handoff. And then we were able to start building a rubric about what does it look like to be effective in this thing you're calling teamwork. We would talk about some, we, we sort of renamed it something else, right? So I think one, we're gonna to have to be really good at working with employers. When we, our program design is gonna to have to be really good at understanding competencies and know that our employers will sometimes struggle with that. Secondly, I think um, the war for talent 10 million unfilled jobs is going to drive quicker adoption of micro-credential programs. Three, it may finally allow us to start dropping the college degree requirement for jobs that don't require college degrees because that, as Bayern de Goose would argue, deeply inequitable. Think about who doesn't have college degrees. So I think we start to make progress on a number of fronts. Um, and it's not an accident that this started in technology because the war for talent has been longstanding and deep in the technology sector, which struggles to find people. We will now see it across industries. I'm going to um, pause the Q&A. We have two minutes left. Um, I'm pretty sure Paul and his sneakers will stick around and talk to you one another. Um, last question, Paul. Um, you have another book on its way. Um, tell us about it to close. Summarize that book. We'll come back next year and we'll talk about it when it's published. But oh, thank you preview, for preview the next book for no, us. No, thank you Paul. for asking. So when I wrote this book, I was sidetracked by a question that I was increasingly haunted by, which is why do our large-scale social systems that are designed to lift people up so often come to dehumanize the very people they're meant to serve? This happens in K-12 all the time. Uh, it happens in post-secondary all the time. Just think alone of the pressure we put on high school kids about the college admissions pro process, the mental health damage and trauma we inflict routinely. And I could sort of go down a whole list of things. But this happens in healthcare. I mean, it starts when they ask you to put the paper Johnny on. Like, well, that wasn't dehumanizing enough, and then it just goes from there. Um, so I started interviewing people and talking to people who I work in those systems and are rethinking those systems, and then spent a lot of time talking to sociologists and people like Sarah Goldrick Robb, um, uh, amazing people uh, in, in fine universe, and then psych psychologists as well. So Jessica Brennan at NYU and um, Matt Steinfeld at Yale, and it was, it was the best year of learning ever. And the thing that's so wonderful and encouraging about this is that a lot of smart people are reinventing these systems. There are really wonderful solutions that have fundamentally better outcomes. And I'm gonna, I'll save you buying the book because here's, what it, here's where it sort of came down to. Scale systems drive humanity out. H human beings and humanity is messy. And scale systems don't like messiness. They like clear segmentation procedural rules. So the first chapter of the book is called Mattering. And it was inspired by Greg Elliott, a wonderful sociologist at Brown who writes about this idea. Started with gangs, his study of gangs. Why do, people, why do, why do young people join gangs? Because when your whole world, only 
message is you don't matter. Your school is awful. The only message you could take is this place doesn't care about me. Your home is broken. Uh, the, the, right? Gangs say you matter. Gangs say, nope, you, have a, you belong. And mattering is not only what we will do for you. We'll, we'll, we'll kill someone to protect you. You're a member of our gang. It's also expectation. Right? So it's about the poverty of expectation. The second chapter goes to aspiration. It's not enough to matter, but you have to lift people's sights. You have to help them dream bigger dreams. And I had a wonderful interview with Matt Beale, so one of the interviewees who's the head of child and adolescent psychology at Georgetown. And, and I asked Matt about resiliency. Why do some people make it out? And he said, no, resiliency takes three things. Some passion, any passion that you can hook onto. The second is that um, you've had, ideally, one year of normal. So when you look around, you go, you know what? This isn't normal. Like this, because we, 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 we normalize, right? You sort of, um, but the third and most important thing is you have to have someone who believes in you. So I don't know if you read Hillbilly Elegy, a book I really deeply despise. But one part that did resonate with me in that book, if you, if you have read it, was his grandmother, who was crazy, if you remember the book. Like crazy. And yet she believed he was better than the world in which they were in. She believed he would be out of that world, that he needed to be out of that world in some way. And she's the driving animus, the force of that book. So the second chapter, so my point in all that, we move from there, and finally we do get the systems in the book. But my point of this is all of these innovators are starting with very human questions, and then they're rethinking how they think about systems and scale without losing the humanity at the heart of it. Um, Paul? On behalf of all of us, um, and on many levels, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for attending. Yeah, thank you.